Hello. Yes. All, All right. right. Let's <laughs> jump. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Let's jump right into it. You're live. Welcome <laughs> again, Roche, Doctor Roche Khan. Um, this is part three of your series. And um, before we share the screen and get started, can you tell our audience what you're doing and you know what is to be expected? Absolutely. Well, Selwyn, as always, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be on CWS. You know, over the past uh, two sessions, uh, we've really, you know, in session one, gone over the importance of being online, uh, the importance of mobile commerce and, and e-commerce, uh, why SEO is important, why you need to be able to be found on the internet. And uh, in the second session, we, we dived into a little bit of the fundamentals, talking about sales funnels. We talked about value ladders as well. And you know, all the, although these concepts may be simple, uh, you know, oftentimes when folks run into issues uh, in business, uh, it's because they've forgotten the fundamentals. You've got to go back to basics. So, you know, for the young entrepreneurs out there uh, who are looking to build, uh, for the aspiring entrepreneurs who are looking to get into this, and for those veteran entrepreneurs who are looking to learn something new in the space of digital, this is what we've really been focusing on uh, over the past two sessions. And over this session, so in, We'll be talking uh, about traffic. You know, we talked about funnels, but these funnels don't work unless you're able to drive traffic, right? Foot traffic, click through traffic. Ultimate, ultimately, people need to be able to offer. People need to see your website. People need to see your ads. So how do we do that? We're going to talk about uh, traffic, and we're also going to dive into a little bit of consumer psychology. Mm. So before we start building everything out, we're really going to talk about well, what are the things that we need to think about as it relates to our audience, as it relates to uh, our prospects, and what do we need to have in place? So I'm really excited, Selwyn, to, to dive into the and, material. And I am very excited because if, if I can remember, there was a lot to learn last, last week. There was a lot yes. going on. And I remember two basic concepts, two, two uh, concepts, the ladders and the, the ladder and the funnel. Excellent. And the way I remember it is because I was asking the question, well, a funnel starts wide and goes down narrow and a ladder goes up. They seem to be, you know, diametrically opposed. Why is, and you explained to me, right. you know, why the funnel starts wide and it comes down to the bottom. But in the interest of time, let's get started yeah. and we're going to share the screen and you take it away, Rosh. Excellent. Let me know uh, when you can see my screen, Selwyn. All right, there you are. Three types of traffic. Okay. Excellent. So we are going to get tactical and we are going to dive right into it, Selwyn. Sh should, now, should, we, should our we, audience take out their notepad, um, Dr. Khan? Absolutely. Look, this, this information here, the way I've, I've built it is so that you're not hearing too much of me saying things that aren't on the slides. So what I'm basically covering will be on the slides. So Selwyn, whether you want to make this available to your audience, um, you know, whether folks want to take screenshots as they go through this or they want to take notes, uh, I'm game for anything. Awesome. Take it away. All right. So three, there are three types of traffic. And, and just so we understand uh, when we mention that word traffic, what we're talking about, we're ultimately talking about people. Okay. It's easy to get caught up in, in terms like, you know, eyeballs and users and traffic and that type of thing. But truly, we want to think about people. And there's three types of ways we can get people to be in front of our products and services. And there's three types of traffic. So there's the traffic that you own, there's the traffic that you control, and there's the traffic that you don't control. And what we're going to do is spend a little bit of time getting into each and every one of these. So let's start first with number one, traffic that you own. Now, out of all the types of traffic out there, Selwyn, this is the best kind of traffic, okay? Traffic that you own. So when I mention that, I'm referring to if you have an email list uh, of, of your followers, of your readers, of your customers, basically a database of leads that allows you to reach out to these individuals at any point in time. That's your data, 
That's your information. And at any point in time, you're the one who can reach out to them and send traffic to this, that specific place on the internet. Uh, could be your website, could be your offer, could be your landing page, could be your Facebook page. But ultimately, if you email these people, because it's data that you own, they can get in front of your offer. And we call this traffic you own because you can send out an email, you can post a message, you can make them go to your blog post, and it will instantly create traffic. Okay, So this is not uh, hard for anyone to do. If you've got that database, all you're doing is letting those folks know, hey, I'm sending you this email about this new offer. Come check out my website. They click over from their website and from, from that email and they land on the website. Now, this is what we call you know, our own distribution channel, if you will, because you can send out messages at any time you want and there are no new marketing costs. That's the cool part about this, Selwyn. You know, you don't have to pay to get in front of these individuals. You already own that data. You already own that traffic. And you can sell things to these people over and over again. And all that money comes back to you as pure profits, of course, minus the overheads relating to the actual uh, product or service that you're offering. But essentially, you're not spending money to advertise to these people over and over again. You already have them in your database. Ro Roche, before, before you, you go on to traffic control, one, Absolutely. Quick, one quick thing that, that comes to mind. Um, lots of people would refrain from using their email, email list because there is, this, there is this thing that if I send out email to people, I'll be bothering them. And so a lot of people tend not to want to use their email as 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 a um, as a list, you know, uh, as a contact list, because oftentimes we are so inundated with people spamming us, and so we feel some people feel that to use an email might not be effective. What do you say to that? That is a great question, and let's let's reframe that and understand that it's not necessarily a problem. What an opportunity that is, Selwyn. Now. Here's a, here, you've got a list of people, and they're used to getting these, this barrage of emails, spam email, if you will, from all these people trying to sell them something. And here you have an opportunity to stand out from the crowd. Here you have an opportunity. Remember what we discussed last week? Mm -hmm. Value first with those funnels. That's exactly the same thing you do with the emails. So if we took a content marketing approach, and we gave value first. And instead of just sending them an email every time we have something for sale, and we sent them information that's helpful to them, and then we give them a pathway to buy from us if they're ready, well, and now you're doing something that 90% of the folks aren't doing out there. So it's an opportunity, but it's all in how you treat that relationship. It comes back to that concept of the emotional bank account, right? Imagine that you have this emotional bank account, this relationship bank account with your list, with your customers, with your prospects. You cannot ask them all the time to, to do things for you. That's essentially you're making a withdrawal from that bank account. They can only make that withdrawal. You can only make that withdrawal if you spent enough time putting deposits into that bank account. And how do you make those deposits into that emotional bank account? With value, with content. So if you're selling, for example, a certain type of wood or you own a hardware store and you're selling paint and you're selling nails, what might actually be handy for those individuals is a how-to guide on how to build a porch or a how-to guide on how to fix that issue they're having uh, with their wall or how to uh, install that new fixture so that it's a value first. They go, ah, this person is teaching me. This person is educating me. They're making deposits into our emotional bank account. So when I ask and I say, hey, we've got that offer, we've got that 25% off or that 50% off, because of that relationship, because you've made so many deposits, that person wants to click. It's that whole KLT that we talked about. People have to know you. People have to like you. But ultimately, people have to trust you before they buy from you. Does that answer your question, Selwyn? It answers my question, yes. Brilliant. Yes. So we're going to move over to number two, traffic you control. And now let me tell you, this is one of my favorites because you control traffic 
when you have the ability to tell it where to go. And let me explain this a little bit more. So you've got platforms like Google, you've got platforms like Facebook, and ultimately you don't own that data, right? Those are you as a user on Facebook, you've given that data to Facebook. You as a user with Gmail, you've given that data to Google. So you don't own that traffic. That traffic, it belongs to Facebook and Google. However, when you launch an ad on their platform, what you ultimately do is that you're able to control that traffic because you're buying space on their platform so that when people see it, if it interests them, they click on it. And when they click on it, you ultimately tell them where to go. You tell that click where to go. It happens automatically based on how you set up your system with Facebook or Google. This is Facebook. You, this is traffic you control. And an easy way to look at this is that anytime you're paying for an advertisement, whether it's in the offline space or whether it's in the digital space, any kind of paid traffic is quite simply traffic you control. That could be email ads. That could be those pay-per-click ads that you see online. It could be those banner ads that you see when you're surfing the internet. They could be native ads. And that term is, is relatively new uh, for people uh, who, for people in entrepreneurship, this is new in the digital marketing space. Native ads referring to ads that are ads, but don't look like ads. So it may look like a regular blog post. It may look like someone just making a video, but truly, if you actually uh, dive into it a little bit more, you'll realize they're selling something. Those are called native ads. Mm. You're also doing um, uh, traffic you control if you have an affiliate partner, if you have a joint venture partner, if you're taking ads out in the newspapers, this is all traffic that you control. And everyone loves traffic they control. But the problem here is that every time you want more traffic you can control, guess what? You need to spend more money, right? It costs money to get in, in front of Google. It costs money to, to put your ad in the newspaper. It costs money to get onto Facebook. So this is why it's really important that your goal here should be to always send any traffic that you're going to purchase from any one of these platforms over to a type of website that we call a landing page, a squeeze page, an opt-in page. So ultimately, if you're getting clicks right, from any one of these platforms, or if you've got an ad in the newspaper, ultimately, if people are going to your online asset, you want to be able to capture their name and email address like we talked about last week. And if they're going to your store based on that coupon that you put in the newspaper, you definitely want to be able to capture their, their name, their email address, their phone number physically. And before I move on to the next one, so and let me, let me just mention how important this is. Because let's say you're spending $5 a day on Facebook. We're talking U.S. here. Yes. We're, talking, we're spending $5 a day on Facebook. And let's say you know your numbers. And on average, those $5 are getting you about 100 clicks. All right, so these are 100 fresh people that you've targeted that you know are going to be interested in your product. You don't know if they're going to buy it, but you know there's an interest there. Of those 100 clicks, let's say five people buy from you. Now, you know if you spend $5 every day, you're going to end up with five sales on average. Now, what, what this means is if you understand traffic you control, you can decide to spend $10 because that $10 will equate to 200 clicks. Those 200 clicks will equate to 10 buyers, right? Yeah. Now, what if you say, oh man, I found a winning formula here and it's working. For every $10 that I'm spending, I'm getting 10 people into my, into my program or purchasing my product. That is when you find that golden formula, that winning formula where you amp up the ad spend. But of course, it takes time to get there and you have to pay attention to your numbers. Now, if you want to get in front of those people again that clicked, but you had a landing page and you collected their name and email address, guess what, Selwyn? You don't need to pay to get in front of them again. You can email them. The people that you're getting in front of with the $10 and the $15 and the $20 are brand new people. Does this make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. Brilliant. So we move on to number three, traffic you don't control. 
And this type of traffic just shows up and you really don't have any control over where it came from. Okay. This is maybe somebody who mentions you on social media. You didn't ask them to do it, uh, but they featured you. And if someone comes across their network and comes across their post, they'll eventually end up on your website. If they decide to click through and check it out, you can't really control that. If you put something on a blog somewhere and people are Googling, you can't control uh, how many people are Googling what, but perhaps they find you based on search traffic. Or if you did a guest blog, or if you made a YouTube video, or if you were featured in the newspapers, or in a brochure, or in a flyer, or on a billboard, ultimately you can't really control what people do with that, but they come across it because it's on the internet somewhere, or because someone has featured you. So it's important, it's important to also cater for these guys, Selwyn, because they may come into your establishment, they may be actually one of the best types of prospects, because maybe it was word of mouth. Somebody else mentioned, they don't know you personally, but because of a first degree connection or a second degree connection that you have with someone else, they came across you. So we need to cater for those individuals when they jump on our website, where we introduce what we do, we're able to get them into a, we, we have an opening where they can start a relationship with us uh, as well. All right, so those are the three types of traffic. It's important to understand the three types of traffic as we start to go into the next section, which is really gonna talk about psychology and communication. Because the way you communicate to your prospects will, di will, will dictate where you should be in terms of the type of traffic that you want. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about next, Selwyn, you know, it, it, it may seem, I think to, to better entrepreneurs, it may seem like, hey, I've heard this before, but do not overlook this. Again, it comes down to fundamentals. It comes back to bringing it back to basics. So let's get started. If we're going to create wildly profitable funnels, if we're going to create an audience, you know, that's really going to resonate, we have to first understand that audience. I can tell you so many stories, Selwyn, of people who, because of their passion or because they love what they do, they just go out there and they offer it. But they forget about their audience. They forget that they need to frame the message in a certain way so that it speaks to the audience. So we need to understand the audience and we need to know them intimately. All right. So in business, we talk about demographics, right? You want to know if you're going to put some ads out there, if you're going to put some posts out there. We need to be thinking about these things, okay? Well, my audience, what's typically their age? Uh, what's their gender? What's their, what's their ethnicity? Uh, what kind of jobs do they have? What's their income level? Where are they located? That's, that's huge. Where someone is located will dictate the type of content you create. What's their marital status? All right, so a lot of times businesses overlook this. And the truth is, even if you're focused on demographics, there's something else that's even more important that we need to be focusing on. So more than demographics, we need to focus on psychographics, mm. right? So we've got to think beyond just the age and the gender. We've also got to think about, well, hang on a second. It's not just about their age. What level of education do they have? Because you could put something out there that completely misses people. You could put something out there that's maybe too juvenile and copy for your audience that is more sophisticated. So you need to think about education. You need to think about, well, what are their hobbies and interests? Even down to their political affiliations. When you look at the data and you look at the trends in the US, you can actually see that there are different buyer trends based on whether somebody's independent, Democrat, or Republican. It's interesting, right? You wanna think about their favorite periodicals, their favorite books. You wanna think about their past purchases. And this doesn't have to be all one person uh, sell one because I know there are people out there who offer products to a wide range of folks or services to a wide range of folks. So what you want to do is you want to break out a couple of different um, target markets, a couple of different customer avatars, customer profiles. So you're focusing on perhaps that 25 to 30 year old female, but you're also catering to that 40 to 50 year old male who's thinking about retirement. Right? So it's really about sitting down and thinking about who can consume my products 
and getting to know them by asking yourself, well, what are the demographics and what are the psychographics? And I put this up here, Selwyn, because it's something we talked about in the past, but it's really important for young entrepreneurs to, to, to see, to listen, to hear. Your passion, regardless of how passionate you are, your passion must intersect with practicality. You've got some people out there, Selwyn, who are so darn passionate about what they do. And you know, we refer to them as so, the starving artists, if you will. They love what they do. They, they'll continue doing what they do from now until the day they die. They love it. They live for it. But the truth is, if we want to make sales, we have to get practical. And by getting practical, we need to think about how we get in front of individuals. And that's what leads us to understanding the prospect web w e b is an acronym an acronym that stands for wants so when we're talking about desires you got to think about well what is your prospect your potential customer what do they deeply want what do they deeply desire we also want to talk about well how do they identify specifically what are their emotions so there's two things you want to think about when you're thinking about emotions number one how does your prospect feel currently? You need to get into that state of mind. And or how do they crave to feel? And of course, you want to talk about their values, their belief system. You need to think this through. Remember that we've all, we've all as humans, we've got closely held beliefs. So if you want to create copy, if you want to create ads that really get people to pay attention, to get people to click, you have to understand as best you can their values their belief system. So there's a couple of things we can ask ourselves, all right? Number one, what are your audience's general beliefs? Just sit down, think about this, okay? What does the audience believe about the fundamental problem or situation that you are tackling? Okay, they probably have beliefs around this issue, okay? What does the audience believe about the area that you operate in. So although you may have the best product, Selwyn, you may have the best solution, understand that you are a product or a service within an industry. So how do people even feel about that industry? I hear this all the time from our, our clients that are car, car dealerships. And people have a negative perception, for example, about used car salesmen, right? But the truth is you need to not deny that people have those beliefs, you need to embrace that so that you're able to create a message that differentiates you. What does your audience believe about your type of organization? And last but not least, what does your audience believe about the other people operating in your area? Very, very important. So it's not just about what people think about you. Think about what do people think about my industry and specifically, what do people think about my competition? as well. You with me, Selwyn? I'm with you. I'm getting the sense that, um, well, from what I'm gathering is that an ad is not an ad is not an ad. You, you, <laughs> yes. Right? You, you must target, you must understand your audience. You must, it's like um, uh, speaking, um, giving a speech in front of an audience. You must understand your target audience. You must un understand their um, the, 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 the psychology of your audience and so on and so forth. Now, here's the question. Some people would say, well, I thought only big companies bothered about with these um, various graphics and psychographics. Right. Why right. should little old me, uh, a business person now getting into the game, be concerned? Why don't I just throw up an ad, tell my family and friends, look, come to my website. I'm selling, old, I'm selling slippers and shoes. Um, why, 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 why would that not work? Right. Excellent. Excellent. Great question. Uh, Selwyn, I love what you said just now. An ad is an ad is an ad, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the truth is, the truth is a human is a human is a human. Mm. Now it doesn't matter if you are a large multinational corporation, international corporation, or you're a small business owner. The truth is, at every level, you're ultimately selling to humans. And if you are selling to people, 
people like you, people who have dreams and hopes and aspirations, just like ourselves, we have to understand that if people don't bother to take the time to get to know us, do we take that step? You know, think about our own behavior. There are certain ads that speak to us because we feel like the ad gets us. We feel like, yes, yes, that is the emotion I'm going through, as opposed to, hey, guys, 75% off, or hey, guys, sale. Now, that may get me to pay attention, but does that move me emotionally to purchase? Well, it's going to depend on the product or service. So at any level, Selwyn, you're really going to need to think this through. It's important. And if multinational corporations, if international corporations are doing it, why wait until you get to that stage? Why not start now? Well, and this is the opportunity. This is the opportunity in the small business space because there are so many people who are just not doing it. You become an easy standout. Is that, does that answer your question, Selwyn? It answers my question. It answers my question. Why not take, uh, the adva take an, ad an advantage that is, that is there for the taking? I understand. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and it comes back to what we call the BTAR cycle, okay? Because ultimately, our beliefs, whatever they are, whatever paradigms we hold, our value system is ultimately going to impact the kinds of thoughts that we have. And the kinds of thoughts that we have is going to impact the types of actions that we take. And the types of actions that we take will ultimately dictate the kind of results that we get. Now, this is the case across the board. Again, a human is a human is a human. So if you can not get people to necessarily, not to influence their actions, but to influence at a more fundamental level, their beliefs and their thoughts, you'll get them to take the right actions and thus see the right results. And we're spending a little bit of time on belief because it's very, very important. What do they, they referring to the prospect, to the potential customer, what do they need to believe about you in order to buy? How many times have we seen a good product or service, but because we didn't really feel good about that, the guy who was selling it to us or the gal that was selling it to us, we took a pass on it. So what do people need to believe about you, the individual, in order to buy? What do people need to believe about themselves in order to buy? Very important for you to think about. And ultimately, what do they need to believe about your product or service in order to buy? Are you establishing authority? Are you establishing credibility? Are you establish, establishing trust? This is not just about putting something out there. It's really important that you get into the mind of your prospect. This is what we say all the time in the Masterclass Institute. If you market to everyone, you market to no one. If you market to everyone, you market to no one. We live in a day and age where so much data is available. It's on us as a small business entrepreneur to use the data and to make sure that we're not wasting money, but that we're spending money to get it in front of the right person. And we'll only know if it's in front of the right person if we take the time to analyze think about who our potential prospects are. And we need to understand the difference, Selwyn, between needs versus wants. Now, generally, wants are more compelling than needs. If we made a list of our needs and we made a list of our wants, that list of wants will probably twi be twice or thrice as long as our needs. Our needs are more basic. We have to also understand, as small business entrepreneurs, that desire already exists in people. It's up to you to channel that existing desire. And ultimately, Selwyn, people want outcomes. People want results. And I usually, when I, when I do this in bigger groups, Selwyn, I usually get people say, no, 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 it is about the product. And I say, hang on a second. It's not just about the product. The product is important. But why do people want that specific product? They want that specific product because they're looking for a specific outcome. And sometimes that specific outcome isn't necessarily a physical gain. Sometimes you don't buy that shoe because it's the most comfortable shoe. Sometimes you buy that shoe 
because of the emotional win that you gain by purchasing that specific brand. So it's really, really important to understand that when you're positioning your products, how are you positioning it in a way that people know ahead of time that I'm going to get a specific outcome from this. I'm going to get a specific result. So, and, so one quick yes. question, Rosh, that comes to Go mind. Um, so the introvert who is saying, look, I, I, like my first guest, um, Anika, who has an amazing school, and saying in the beginning she hid behind, behind the name of her school until people started asking questions about this, um, this institute, her institute. What about the introvert who wants to sell but feels that he or she doesn't have the charisma, doesn't have the presence, or you know, uh, people might not necessarily like them? Can they still, is there still hope for them? Oh man, there's so much hope for them. Here's the thing. <laughs> it's a great, great, great question. You know, when we talk about sales and we talk about salespeople, immediately what comes to mind, what comes, you know, to surface is an individual that's enthusiastic, that's charming, that has the answer for you. But more and more, if you look at the research, and we have some clients who are in this space, in the call center space, sometimes it's not actually the individual who is most quote unquote salesy that gets the most sales at the end of the month. Sometimes it's the individual who's more introverted that gets the most sales at the month. Why? Because they're spending more time with individuals. They're going deeper on the relationship. They're asking questions. They're aiming to solve, not to sell. And if you're able to help people solve the issue, walk them through, why your product or your service is a good fit for them, they're going to KLT. They're going to ultimately know, like, and trust you. So it's not just about enthusiasm. You know, you've got different personas in sales. You've got the hardcore closer who's just always ready for you, but you've also got a sales buddy, the sales pal. You've also got a personality that we call the professor, the friend, the person who's there to say, I'm, I'm probably not going to be the most charming or enthusiastic person, but let me walk you through why this is good for you. And in that case, it's going to come down to compassion, to caring, and having a system of questions to walk people through. So it's more a consultative sales approach as opposed to just doing your 30-second pitch and hoping that someone buys. Now, if still you have issues as a young entrepreneur, you still don't feel comfortable, even though you're taking that one-on-one -on -one approach, even though you're leading with compassion first and value first. What I recommend you do is that you find a partner, you find a team member, you find someone who can help you sell or help sell on your behalf, uh, who can get the word out there. And for me, Selwyn, a lot of people don't believe this, but you know, my default mode is I, I'm, I'm more an introvert than I am an extrovert. And people say, well, Roche, perhaps you're an ambivert. You're a little bit of both. But for me, I, I step into a character when I need to. The truth is, I didn't really like selling when I first got started. It was really hard for me, the introverted guy, to start putting something out there. And again, that's where digital started to play a very special role. Because here was an opportunity for me to sell on scale. For me to make one video talking to myself, looking into my laptop, just me, no one else, and having that video go online to meet thousands of people that I run as an ad. And then those people go to my website. I'm not there. I'm not selling. They're on my website. They're filling out a form. They're doing a questionnaire that I would probably have to do in person. But now they're filling it out on the internet. And then at that point, when I know there's all this interest, I get on the phone with them to close that sale. So. All in all, to say, Selwyn, there's lots of different approaches you can take here. And if you're using digital, it will help you. Does that, does that answer your question, Selwyn? It, it does. It does, Roche. Um, you know, we have, this, we have this time constraint, and I couldn't contain myself this afternoon asking you certain questions because they, they're important. And I know you have some slides to make. We can go for another five minutes, Roche, and then okay. um, close off for the evening. Absolutely. You just you just give me the buzz, and um, and then we'll, we'll we'll wrap there. Okay. This 
This book here, Selwyn, How to Write a Good Advertisement by Victor O. Schwab, this is a secret weapon. I need this to is get a this. Secret book. weapon for copywriters. This is a secret weapon for entrepreneurs around the world. You see, that guy, that author is a very special guy because he did a lot of research in psychology and he came up, he came up with what he calls secret human desires. Okay. And ultimately, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, Selwyn. Ultimately, what we found is that people want to gain health, time, money, advancement, increased enjoyment, self-confidence, and personal prestige. I don't care who you are as an individual, one of these things is going to pop out at you. People want popularity, they want to improve their appearance, comfort, leisure, and that pride of accomplishment. Ultimately, as humans, one of these things are going to pop out to you, if not more. And if it's popping out to you, then it's going to pop out to your prospect as well. So knowing this tells you how you need to frame your ad, how you need to frame the copy in your ad. Does this make sense, Owen? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. Now, that's what people want to gain. Ultimately, there are things that people want to be as well. People want to be good parents. I've never heard someone say, I can't wait to be a bad parent. You know, I've, I've, I've never heard that. People want to be sociable. They want to be up to date. People want to be creative. People want to be proud of their possessions. That's why Facebook is what it is. People are happy to showcase things. They're happy to show that highlight reel of their life. People want to be influential over others. People want to be gregarious, efficient, the first in things. This is why Apple and Samsung makes a lot of money as well. This is why when they launch their products to much fanfare, you've got blocks and blocks and blocks of people for a piece of technology that they could get in a week or two, but they want to get it on that first day. So they want to be the first in things. And people ultimately also want to be recognized as authorities. Now, I'm not saying that any one individual wants all of these things, but we can probably think about people in our circle who these can apply to. Now, in terms of what people want to do, people ultimately want to take care of their health and family. People want to express their personalities. People don't like people micromanaging and telling them what to do. So ultimately, you see people who resist domination from others. People want to satisfy their curiosity. They want to emulate the admirable. That's a whole industry by itself. Books written about people like Colin Powell and Oprah and Obama, because ultimately, people want to emulate those individuals. People want to appreciate beauty. They want to acquire, collect things. They want to win other people's affections. They want to improve themselves generally. This here, someone, if people are listening, I hope they realize how important this is. This is the secret sauce to ethical influence. This is the secret sauce to ads that work. And when you understand this, you have a new filter because every time people are driving ads to you, especially the ads we see on TV, because they're spending millions upon millions of dollars to put those ads on TV, you start to see, ah, that's the angle they're taking. That's why that ad is so effective. Now, moving on, people want to save. Ultimately, what are the things that people want to save? Time, money, work, discomfort. I've never heard someone say, I can't wait to be more uncomfortable or more in discomfort. People want to save, worry, doubts, risks, and personal embarrassment. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples here. You see ads that talk about earning more money. You see ads that talk about launching a business. You see ads that talk about winning with stocks. Ultimately, Selwyn, the fundamental driver is people want to be more successful. Yes. People want to yeah. feel more successful. You see, people, you see ads about living healthier, living longer, having more energy. You've got five-hour energy. Look at what that did to the marketplace. Ultimately, because at a fundamental psychological level, people want to feel less mortal. Okay. You see things about learning something, you mastering a skill, fixing what's broken because people ultimately want to feel independent. Oops. People want to save on purchases. They want to build a nest egg. They want to create some type of passive income either online or in real estate, but they want to do something because why ultimately fundamentally, People want to feel more secure. You see ads selling about losing weight, looking younger, getting stronger. At the end of the day, we want to feel attractive. We want to look good when we look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. 
People want to get famous. People want to earn praise. They want to get rewarded. But beyond all of that, underneath all of that, people just want to feel respected. You see ads about sleeping better, eliminating pain, eliminating stress. Again, a fundamental driver here is, well, people just want to feel comfortable. And this is one of my favorites, Selwyn. People want to indulge desire. They want to treat themselves. They want to have the best. Why? You'll see a lot of ads use this. It's because, well, you're worth it. How many ads can we think about where they talk about, you know, well, it's, you're worth it. It's time to indulge. It's time to treat yourself. It's time to have the best. That's the psychological trigger that they're using here. So when I think perhaps this might be a good place, uh, a good place to, to put things on pause, um, taking time into consideration. Uh, what, what do you think? Um, let's go for another two minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. So I think, I think we are wrapping up here. We're going to talk about the five levels of prospect awareness. So although you may map out who your prospect is, although you may understand their psychological drivers, you also have to be aware of their level of awareness. Okay. We've got five categories. You've got the most aware where they only need to know the solution and they're in. They already know about you. They like you. They know you. They trust you. All you need to do is say, guys, buy this thing and they're in. So where does your prospect fit? You've got folks who are product aware. They know what you're going to do. They know about the solution, but they're not, they're not sure that it's what they want yet. You've also got the solution aware folks. You know, they, they know what the desired solution is, but they don't know that you can do anything about it yet. So they know their solutions out there, but they're perhaps not familiar with you or your business. You've got folks who fit into the problem aware category. They know there's a problem, but they don't yet know there's a solution. So just understanding this cell win will immediately tell you how to frame your ad. You see, the people who are in the problem aware phase, if you start selling your solution first, you'll completely miss them. But if you know that they're problem aware, well, then you could start focusing on the problem first. And don't we see this with ads all the time, Selwyn? All the time. Especially in the medical space. We call this the PES formula. The, pro the problem, the explanation of that problem, and then they pitch you on solving the problem and ultimately selling the PES formula. And we see this in ads all the time, right? Do you suffer late at night? Do you have trouble with insomnia? Do you have back pain? I mean, we've all seen those types of ads. Yes. And ultimately, because we know they're trying to educate people on a solution, those folks are in the problem aware stage where they're trying to hit on the problem. And then, of course, you've got the completely unaware. They've got no knowledge of anything except his own identity or opinion. They're just really sort of just going with the flow. They're not even sure they have a problem yet. So these are the five levels of awareness. It's very important that we think about market sophistication. That's a very interesting term that more entrepreneurs, I believe, need to do a little bit more research on when I talk to folks about market sophistication. Ultimately, what that means is don't think that your market is dumb. Understand that your market is smart. Understand that your target market is strategic. Understand that they are sophisticated. So don't put things out there where you insult the intelligence of the reader, insult the intelligence of the viewer or the prospect. Think about their level of sophistication. Think about their level of awareness. And that, Selwyn, brings us to the end of the presentation today. Ultimately, my charge, my challenge, is that we're entering into uh, a season of commerce. You know, we just had Black Friday sales. We just had Cyber Monday. Ultimately, my challenge is to take, for anyone listening, not to overlook this because perhaps it sounds simple, but to understand that there's a lot at play. And if you get this right, I promise you, I guarantee you, if you get this right, you take the time to understand your audience, to understand their level of awareness, to craft something based on demographics and psychographics, your click-through rate, your opt-in rate, your lead rate, your sales rate ultimately your conversion rate will be higher. So put one of these things into play and start reaping the benefits. Roche, um, I, I want to bring you on. Bring you on. Can you flip your camera? Absolutely. So we can chat for a bit.
sure. Um, let me see. Oops. Um, hang on. So All right. I think that's, I can stop sharing. Fine. That's and fine. I should there pop you back are. on. There you are, my brother. So great. <laughs> this is the, this was very interesting, Roche. And um, very informative, uh, very encouraging, I should say. Not just interesting, but encouraging. Because what it is saying is that you can sell something. Yes. Uh, if you have the right tools, you have the right attitude, you have the right commitment, and you could study the uh, various principles. And if you apply them right, you can sell. So this idea of just throwing up a stall, and I'm using vernacular because a lot of our audience yes. are Guyanese, throwing up a stall and yes. spreading out fruits and just waiting for the passers passerby to purchase a mango or something, that's not good enough. It's 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 not good enough, so when you know, then then you're just one of everyone else. You, you you're just part of the crowd, you're just part of the herd. You know, you want to stand out. Um, you want to stand out with, you know, s simple things like uh, if you're using that example of the stall, like physically, I'm thinking in a marketplace, um, how are you standing out? What's different? You know, is it, it the optics need to catch people's attentions? And then once you catch their attention, what are you doing to build that relationship with them? And, you know, aside from, quote unquote, the stall, you're thinking about the business. Ultimately, how are you driving traffic to that business? Is too many businesses deploy what we call Hope marketing, and they're just hoping people walk through the door. You know, you need to be strategic. You need to be smart about getting your message in front of people. And so, and let me also say that I hope, I hope this information doesn't also inundate entrepreneurs because I know they've got a lot of information coming their way from a lot of different sources. But just understand that most of these things are nuanced, right? Many layers and levels here. So you only need to start with one. Pluck any one of the things we talked about, streamline it accordingly, and then based on good results, then you'll continue to optimize and add as you go. Don't think that you need to start out of the gate with all of these things in place. Because basically, we, we talk about the Franklin Covey, uh, Dr. Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Before you can expect your prospects to understand where you're coming from, you need to sit down and think about where they're coming from. And ultimately, that's going to help you sell more. So, Roche, what we have had so far, and, and uh, you can help me out here, is that you need, first, yes. you need to know what you want, what you have, what is it you want to sell. Then you need to know your audience. You need to be able to identify your audience. You, know, you, you select your market, um, your target. You, you, um, you need to, and, and it's not just about having one thing. And, and then when you, you advertise, to drive traffic, you must be able to drive traffic to an action page, a page where yes. you can either um, take action by gathering um, email addresses or selling to these people. But value is very important. Cultivate your audience. First. Don't take advantage. Um, these are just some things that I'm remembering. I'm throwing back at you. They, um, well, they'll, they'll, they'll ignore you, Selwyn. They'll, complete, they'll ignore you without thinking about it. If you're not value first because you're just one of everything else so so that's a huge differentiator your mar the market is um is not dead it is sophisticated it is smart you you, you ended the conversation with challenge your challenge yes and you are confident rosh i know from conversations we have had personal conversations and your own uh, personal journey you're confident that this these principles work in this model but the question most people might be asking tonight is why? Why are you so confident that it works? Yeah, um, because it's proven, Selwyn. Uh, this isn't something that, that Roche created. Uh, this is not something that Roche came up with. Uh, this is based on marketing principles. This is based on data. This is based on research, uh, not just in my business, but across the board. You know, we've been really blessed uh, to work with Fortune 500 companies, companies like Starbucks, Armani Exchange, Ford Motor Company, tons of other uh, companies and businesses around the world. And it's these concepts, these very concepts that enable them to do well. And it's not just to say that it works at that level. When we put these very basic principles into play at the small business level, at the micro level, at the nano level, if you will, 
people that don't even have a store and all they have is an ability to be able to create a fan page to understand the audience, to write a couple of lines that speaks to them, to put that out in front of them, to run it as a Facebook ad. You know, when, when, when people call us and tell us about the life-changing experiences that they've had because of their business, because of what their business can now do for them and for their customers, and it's, it's heartwarming because all we're doing is sharing very basic concepts, very basic principles, and ultimately it's the people that implement uh, that are gonna reap the benefits. So I'm very confident, Selwyn. Um, you know, we, we, we keep churning out success story after success story, and it's only because of these principles put into, uh, put into play. Roche, thank you. Thank you very much. What is next? Uh, uh, do we pick up, do we come finish off in January? What, what, what is next? Or do we wait until yes. in January we finish off? I, I, think, I, think, I think we're good. I think we're good for now. I think we've given people a lot of great material uh, to absorb and to, to start implementing. And uh, once, we, once we get started uh, in January again, uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to get more granular, more tactical as we go. So a lot of this is, is, is the overarching information, the overview, if you will. Um, but as it relates to, well, now that I understand this, how do I write that ad? How do I create the right image for that ad? How do I post it on Facebook? Where do I post it on Facebook? How do I run that ad? We're going to get more tactical and tactical as we go in the new year. Well, you've definitely given many of us in this arena hope. Um, these principles um, are hopeful. They are motivating. And um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Selwyn, for, for bringing me onto your platform and giving me the opportunity to share this with your audience. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Take care, Selwyn.